This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Jonathan Baker. How you doing, brother? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man. I thank you for uh, for being on the show. So before we, I want before we get into it, I want to know how you got into the business. Okay, I was. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question. I was uh, I was dyslexic growing up, and so I was made fun of quite a bit. And my parents realized that I had rhythm, and so I would drum on everything. <laughs> and so they got me into music lessons. And that was the beginning of my performing career when I was really young. And so I started on the theater performing side. And then <clears throat> when my mother passed away when I was 20, I tried to figure out how to make money. And I got a job on Wall Street. And then I stopped performing. And I was kind of lost for a while in my 20s. And I, I don't know, I basically <laughs> took some of the money I was, where I was making on Wall Street. And I decided to produce some shows in New York and you know, put up some one act plays and I just got on the producing side and I ended up uh, leaving the Wall Street job and went to Broadway and learned how to kind of line produce and develop some shows there. And then 9-11 happened and then I moved to LA and I got a job on a, at a studio and that was sort of the big break for me. And then, and what studio did you work at? I worked at Sony. And you did a, a few movies I heard, a few, a couple of movies you did there. I did. Yeah, I was very <laughs> fortunate. I, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, you know, when you work at a studio, you're working on a ton of movies at the same time, and it's, it's kind of the perspective and the, you know, there's just a lot that goes into it. But I was on the TV side initially doing uh, TV research, and then I moved over to TriStar and Screen Gems. And so uh, it was all genre movies. I mean, <clears throat> things like, you know, Silent Hill and Underworld and Resident Evil and In the Cut and, I mean... Uh, there's just back to the, uh, 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 Lords of Dogtown, you know, it's just about 40 some odd films. Now, when you were when, in, what, in what capacity did you work on these films as a, an executive? I was a marketing um, I was a marketing manager for a lot of it. And what what happened for us is because we had uh, we had a really successful group of people, um, fantastic executives. I was under Valerie Van Gallagher and, and Mark Weinstock. And these are two very iconic uh, people in the marketing world today. Um, and we were, we were very successful with a couple of franchises, and then we got the right to make our own movies under TriStar. So once we kind of graduated in, in some respects from just marketing, then we were all really involved all the way across the board, picture picking and uh, picking up scripts and, and actually producing. When um, if I remember correctly, Underworld was a, a, a pretty much like of a uh, was a, a dark horse uh, of a film yeah. because nobody it was done for I, if I remember correctly because I was I was younger when that came out obviously but the yeah. uh, the the budget on that was like something like twenty million dollars because they were like one of the first films to shoot over in Eastern Europe Budapest yeah Budapest, Budapest yeah. exactly and they just yeah. milked it like milked the production value and they just yeah. And it yep. was a, obviously a huge monstrous hit and just spawned off an entire series. Yeah, that was one of the turning points for us in that department. And it was, you're right, it, it was made for a really what I call smart, smart number. And Len Weissman um, and Lakeshore uh, were able to really, really deliver a sizable scope for that, yeah. for that, for that number. And uh, it was super stylized and he was extraordinarily creative. And um, it was just a really uh, marketable, marketable movie. I mean, mm -hmm. vampires versus werewolves. I mean, it sells, I mean it, it sells itself pretty much. Yeah. And everyone he, looked kind of Matrix-esque because it was during that time. So everyone was kind of dressed in the yeah. leather and it was very stylized. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, and, and that, that sort of put us on the map from a, a department standpoint. And from that point on... Um, it became sort of a really special place to be. We were a really small group. There were only like eight of us in that department at that time, and we started to win the weekend, and it just became sort of a, a, a very uh, – it, it was a training ground, and I think everybody past a certain point. We were all there for a couple of years, and then executives started getting poached, and they started lifting up, and Val ended up running <clears throat> worldwide marketing distribution, and then Mark did, and um, – it was a, uh, it was sort of, 
interesting because when you work in a studio like that, you become really close with people. It's like a family, you know, and uh, when people started to kind of uh, get taken up, it, it became more of a, it was, it was sort of sad, um, but, but people went on to really great things. Now, what are some of the biggest lessons you learned with, when working within the studio system? Oh, the studio system is a really amazing place to be to get experience. I, I think for me, um, at that time, I had been through so much in New York. I had declared medical bankruptcy. I had gone through 9-11. I had a lot of, uh, of challenges when I was trying to get uh, myself uh, figured out artistically. I was mourning my mother. Um, so New York was really, really, really complicated for me. And I, I, when I left and I came to LA, I really needed a lifeline. And, and, the, and Sony was that. Um, it, it was a great place to, for me to grow and, and, and to work with extraordinarily uh, professional people and to learn um, the real business of, of big product. Um, and how it all works. And I think the challenges of the studio at the same time is that for people like yourself and me, we're, we're you know, lean towards creativity and, and, and creative people. There are a lot of people who are really stuck behind a desk. And that is part of the, the trade-off of getting that experience at the same time. But you do sort of feel kept. And for me, uh, after, I don't know, six or so years, I, I felt like there was this turning point. I, I really needed to kind of you know, my, the, the, the words of my mother were echoing in my face. You've got to do this before you get too old. You've got, you've got to try and, and jump back into performing or, or just doing something creative. And so um, <clears throat> there was this moment I was about to be promoted again, and I was looking down the, the golden handcuffs again. And I decided I had been writing a lot of music at night, and I would go home. And uh, for me, just to kind of survive the environment, I would I – would, I would go home and, and, and compose. And uh, one of those uh, songs ended up being sort of the, the kernel of a short film. And I just thought, I need to, I need to do this again before this becomes a, a, a never ending story of, of, of getting locked into a box and, you know, having to support yourself by having a, a day job. Um, but the kind of value that it, it creates is um, it, it's a, it's a extraordinary group of people with extraordinary resources and you're dealing with uh, the kind of capital where you have carte blanche ability to execute a, the kind of scope that makes a worldwide product and it's, it's, a, it's the biggest game in the world. So there's just something about that level of excitement, the level of resources, the skill set, the craft, the people around you are extraordinarily impressive and um, it's a huge team and the, the teamwork element is quite quite profound. I miss that the most. I think I missed, I miss the sense of family the most when you're, we're working time and time again with a group of people on movie after movie after movie after, or, or show after show or whatever that is. Those are, the, those are the pros and the cons, if you will. Now, you working within the studio system, you must have seen a lot of directors and had interaction with a lot of directors coming in and out through these kind of genre films through Screen Gems. What was, what was like, if, you know, without calling anybody's name out, what was the, like, the biggest mistakes or the biggest common things that you saw that made directors either fail or just get in their own way or something along those lines? And then on the opposite side, what was like, I mean, you kind of said it with Len Wiseman, but like, what was the other, on the opposite side, like, this is, this is how you do it right. And this is how you take advantage of something. So on the both sides. That's an interesting question. Um, I saw a lot of different kinds of directors come through, lots of different kinds of experience levels. Um, the, the better directors who, who, who were really experienced and, and knew how to navigate the system were used to the political uh, yeah. dynamic. Okay? Yeah. Um, and in, in a studio system, it's really interesting because it is a bit more democratic than I think people realize. There's a lot of there's a lot of group think that goes into it and <clears throat> it, it is, it is usually up to one person. Like it does have a pecking order and there is like the big boss and they will say yes or no. But a lot of people, what I like to say, they don't like to go it alone, you know? So there is this sort of like, well, what do you think? What do you think? And then you use a lot of research and then and you, you, you try to, you try to get the best sense of what the right thing to do is. And so the filmmakers that I think were the most successful, at least in my perspective, in my mind, were the ones who were 
we're ready to have that much input. We're, we're ready to kind of listen and, um, and sort of democratically go with the flow to the point where they realized that it isn't, you know, in a tour like environment. It's, it's, um, you're answering to what I call public money. Um, it is a very different kind of artistic process. You have a release date. It's, um, it's a, it's a process of deliverables, like it's a system, and you have to move on down the field whether you like it or not. Um, you have to finish that movie and hand it over. And that's, that's sort of the, 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 the rhythm of, of that. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, um, if, if the filmmakers sort of fought that or, or they created a, a bit of a stew, then what happens is the, the energy of the studio and the people, they don't want to support the filmmaker. They don't want to put, support the film. And it is personal that way. And so you start to see the, not only the economic muscle move into a different place, like it could be reallocated. Um, wow. uh, it, it almost starts to feel like the, 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 the people who really have the, um, the mechanism to do or to not do, they, they may, not be able to get, <laughs> may not be able to get on the phone anymore with you. It's, it's just kind of like they're personally over. They, they don't want to kind of like take that attitude or something like that. It's very passive so aggressive. It's, it's very passive aggressive in that way. <laughs> it, 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 can be, it can be aggressive aggressive. It can mm -hmm. be um, uh, directly uh, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, if a filmmaker has a bit too much hubris or a, a bit of an attitude or they think they know, um, and they, they, they really don't have the perspective that a lot of the, I mean, I, I don't want to be rah, rah, the executives, cause some of them are really, really troubling too. But a lot of the time when you're a filmmaker, you have, and, and I'm saying this from being a filmmaker, so I don't mm -hmm. want to, sure, sure, you know, sure. I, I've, I've been through this on my own, my own personally, y you think, you know, and, and, um, the value sometimes of the executive ranks and the studio ranks is that. I have, I have friends who have worked on over 400 films. I mean, they, and they're not credited on IMDb. Um, these are people who have extraordinarily, extraordinarily, extraordinarily valuable perspectives a lot of the time. And so it's a, it's a balancing act. And I think that if you can go in with that level of, of respect, it tends to go a lot better for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard I've heard of movies, uh, studios doing this. I mean, it's legendary for some some big like you know Robert Altman or uh, I know oh, Kenneth, yeah. Bra uh, Kenneth Kenneth Branagh, where they literally they just literally just shut just they just the, the movie goes to die. It gets released on a horrible weekend, and they get no no P and A money. They don't market it, and yeah. they just literally yeah. go and kill it. And it happened obviously to Orson yeah. Welles and many yeah. of these big directors. It happened, but I'd really never heard a firsthand, you know, account of it. Like, well, you know, if the, they, they will, I mean, obviously if it, the movie is so big, if it's a $200 million movie, they can't do that. But on the older system where movies were done for $20 million or, you know, right. they'll, they'll, they figured out, we'll make our money. We're just not going to really push this guy. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting mix. Uh, sometimes it's hard to actually know exactly what, what's going on with those decisions because you can't see through the economic uh, or the deal. But what, what I like to say in terms of wh where, the, where the right equilibrium is, is, is you, sort of like, you sort of want a studio to have skin in the game so that they can't abandon the movie, right? Um, the filmmaker, you want them to be invested because you want them to actually chase their, their actual real investment. And then in terms of being able to get along, um, then there's actually the personal relationship, which is executive to filmmaker or, or just person to person, like how are people actually in our, uh, communicating with one another? How are they going with the sort of uh, the schedule, the rhythm of it? And, um, and both of those things actually matter quite a bit. It's mm -hmm. quite interesting to see how they actually start to, to kind of seesaw with each other. The, the one thing we, I, you know, we've, I've had many guests on this show and we talk a lot about many topics, but the one area that we really haven't touched upon, and I, I kind of talk about it every once in a while, and it's, a, it's kind of like an unspoken rule that is definitely not taught in film schools, is the politics of not only in the studio system, right. but uh, the politics right. of a film set, the politics totally. of, de of dealing with personalities, dealing with egos. And if you're the director, which most people listening are either want to be directors or producers or, or people in, in, right. in the position of power in these, right. envi in these environments, um, that balancing act is as much of the equation is, as the creative. Because I've met 
creative directors and I've met people who really are wonderful artists right. but had no idea how to deal with personality, psychology, politics. Right. And I was right. told by a, an agent once, he's like, uh, what I'm looking for in a client as a director, I need uh, a filmmaker, I need a politician, and I need right. a businessman. And I go, right. those three aspects have to be, that's, if you look at all the big directors ever in right. history, th the three of them generally combined. So do you have right. any tips for filmmakers on how to navigate the politics of a set and or the politics of the studio system? That's a great question, um, and that's a, that's a very well-framed um, uh, setup, because that <laughs> couldn't be more true. Um, it that. is remarkable. Um, <clears throat> it's remarkable because in, in what we do, sometimes when I, I talk to my Carnegie Mellon students, I'm like, listen, we're not, we're not um, writing a song. You can't get up here and just sing a song, you see? Like, right. that's, that's, that's a specific that's an kind artist. of... That's an art. That's, right, a very, that's a very specific kind of thing. Um, there's no barrier of entry. There's no economic risk to singing a song to me. And I love that stuff, too. Like, trust me, it's great. But in terms of where we're going, we're going to a place where even to accomplish the smallest, you know, film, there's still an economic, you know, reality that we have to kind of understand. And so there's this business um, brain. I, I like to talk about it in terms of there's a hybrid out here, we are hybrids. We have to create a sense of uh, the economics of scale. We have to create a sense of uh, the creativity that uh, balances that. And so we talk about modeling. You know, what's the model and how to how to kind of work within it. Um, and each of those sort of uh, bins have certain pressure points where the people who are going to be in there have certain demands on them. And it's often how they, meaning how you navigate interpersonal relationships that matter the most. So I always say to people, um, you have to respect each other and their, their ultimate specific, specific skill set that you bring to the table. This is because of this economic scale. It's the most collaborative thing that I've ever seen. Um, it's so collaborative that um, you, you have to look at everybody as a teammate, as somebody who has more skill than you have in a very specific thing that you frankly don't want to know that much about. <laughs> I, I'm not, it, like I say, I can edit, but I can just, I can just get by. I don't want to be an editor. I mean, I, I want to be able to speak the grammar, um, but I very much need a fabulous DP and I very much need a fabulous executive. I, I very much need a fabulous producer and a fabulous line producer and an amazing grip. I don't want to be a grip. Um, I, I'm, I'm cool just being over here and, and I'd like to tell a story and I'm interested in exactly what everybody thinks of doing with that kernel. And then, then it's sort of an organic you know, thing that kind of grows out of that. Um, so there's this sense of first and foremost getting to the point where you're so humble <laughs> Mm -hmm. that you, you're the you, humblest you, I mean you're like the most you, humble ever <laughs> yeah I think you have to be and I think that I, I've certainly been worn down by life to the point where it's just like embarrassing and I I just I I I, I love what I get to do now I feel like I'm sort of a uh, an inspirational story for people which is why I really appreciate getting a chance to tell anybody about mm -hmm. it but I think past a certain point any time that my life has not gone right it's because I was either betraying who I was, who mm -hmm. I personally was, or it was because I had some sort of hubris. It, I had some sort of attitude that I was better than somebody else, or, or there's something about that that kicked me in the head again. And, and to this point now, <clears throat> it, it's, it's just this sense of collaboration and looking at people and, and ch picking the people that are going to be on the team with that sense of, can I trust that they have good taste and that they are able to do that job better than, than I could ever want to do and then let it, let it ride from there? I mean, I, I think, and I, I've said this multiple times on the show, but I think it's, it's as important to cast your crew as it is to cast your actors. Critical. Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely critical because yeah. if you, you get a DP who needs 10 hours to light a corner – um, yeah. that's going to be a problem. Yeah. And that corner yeah. might look fantastic, but there has to be a yeah. balance within their yeah. art form and how they do it. And then also 
as a director, yeah. you need to be able to, you know, collaborate, but also at the end of the day, yeah. it has to be, everything has to be filtered through you yeah. as a director, right? And yeah. dealing with these personalities, dealing with these egos, dealing with their own personal, like everyone's got their own personal crap that they're coming in. Like they're, they had a fight Absolutely. with their wife. They, you know, they're Absolutely. getting a divorce. Their kids are doing something or, you know, they, they got into it. They got a ticket that day. Like there's a yeah. thousand things that, that's yeah. never thought about in the creative filmmaking process. It's always like the shot that Scorsese did in yeah, Goodfellas yeah. when he did an uncut <laughs> steady cam like that's fantastic <laughs> right 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 I you, you're bringing up something which is really funny um I just finished producing this movie or we're, we're in the middle of uh, finishing it it's called Sylvie right now but that 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 title is going to change it stars Tessa Thompson and my producing partner Namdi Asamoa and Eva Lagoria, and it's this beautiful jazz era <clears throat> movie and uh it's uh we're, in, we're about to lock picture right now. And um, Declan Quinn is the DP, and uh, he's sort of an iconic, you know, just like old school dude. And he, he first of all, we shot Super 16, and nice. he was, I mean, this movie looks better than most movies that I've ever seen uncolored. Mm -hmm. And it looks fabulous. We haven't even gotten to DI yet. And, uh, yeah. But at the same time, we were shooting um, this movie in, in LA uh, for New York uh, and it was just a big big production and we were moving pretty slow but Declan is the nicest guy in the world he couldn't have been more sweet and uh, you know I'm the producer on set just trying to get this thing to move and I'm like Declan brother please are we are we we're gonna be okay we're gonna be okay it's gonna be fine it's gonna be fine you know and he had this just beautiful demeanor about him and everybody Everybody just responded to him. It was just loving. We're like moving through. Like, did we make our day? He's like, barely every day. You know, it's fine. But it was the way that he was able to do. I was just like, this guy's got a skill. Yeah, as, really, opposed, really. as, as opposed to many DPs that I know you and I have worked with, they're like, get out of my face, you producer. Let me be the artist. You have no idea what you're talking about. Totally, I know how totally. to light. You don't tell me how to do my job. Totally, do you see the difference? Totally. <laughs> no, he, he, it, it was really, it was actually pretty, pretty awesome. And I think this was one of those special movies that we, we did a pickup shoot, like, uh, I think two or three, two, three weekends ago. And it, it was like a reunion. Everybody came back and was like, uh, hugs, like, hey, good to see you, like, oh, we've missed you, your hair is longer, you look like you got some sun, you're like, great, you know, it was great, it was, it was really just like, all right, all right, and a lot of that has to do with my, my producing partner, Nambi, is like the most, you know, gentle-spirited, nicest, classiest guy on planet Earth, the guy's yeah. just an angel, and so everybody's just super loving on, on set, so, you know, you, you can get these great, great collaborations together, then you can also go and have like a whoa, what, you know, this is pretty intense over here. But I think it's definitely from the top down. And you, you know? do appreciate the, the latter when you deal with the... With the, with the <laughs> oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you. When you have the other one, you're like, oh, man. It, and, and you that's do appreciate a, the good And isn't it, yeah. isn't it true, though, once you find groups of people that you really do have a good working relationship, you try to build that team up again and again and again. Try to stick again together. Yeah, you try to stick... Which is why I think with, with some of these, you know, it's iconic filmmakers, you know, they're just... Clint, the same people. It's yeah, just Clint, like they're never Clint Eastwood, gonna, Ron Howard, those guys. Why, 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 you know, try to fix something that's not broken, you know? Without question. Now, you've got yeah. a chance to uh, work on a Sundance winning film called Crown Heights. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. How, yeah. what, what was that? I mean, was that the first time you were at Sundance? Oh, gosh. <laughs> that's funny. No, no. Um, I, when, when I was acting young, in my first short film that I ever acted in went to Sundance in 1997. And it was that's a, pre, a really... That's, cool. that's pre-Sex uh, Sex Lies and Videotape, so it wasn't even... It was, it was Sundance, but it wasn't Sundance yet, right? Or no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, 89, I'm sorry. Was, 89, 89. I'm sorry. That's yeah, yeah. It was right so it after, was already Sundance. Like, it, yeah, it, it became something. It was already pretty, pretty interesting. I had no idea what I was doing. It was, it was me, because I was a theater kid, and this was the first short that I kind of acted in, and it was... It was quirky, and I when I when we got in, I, I don't think I realized what sort of like it meant, you know. Right. And so I, we I went kind of doe eyed and <clears throat> experienced it as a as a college kid, and um, and then since then I've because uh, I teach uh, at Carnegie Mellon a, a feature film economics course, I I told my my awesome administrators uh, 
Dan Martin and Dan Green there. I said, listen, you should you should take the kit. You should take the, uh, the you know students to uh, to Sundance every year because it's such a great melting pot. So we've been taking the 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 class there for I don't know eight years or so. Oh, that's so amazing. I've been in and out of Sundance either with Sony as sort of a buyer, I've been there as a filmmaker, I've been there as a professor, and now when I came back, ironically enough, um, when Crown Heights was there and it won the Audience Award, that was the, my 20th anniversary of, of the short film. So to me, it was like this crazy Cinderella moment where, um, I mean, Crown Heights in and of itself was a Cinderella story at that festival, but 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 that was pretty pretty awesome i felt like i had just won the super bowl it was pretty pretty crazy and, and that movie so. went on to be sold to amazon if i'm not mistaken right yeah amazon picked it up at sundance um and um yeah it was it you know it hit theaters at uh, the 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 fall in the fall after sundance so it is it i i've i've worked on a project that was in uh, that one sunday i won a few awards at sundance and it is a pretty it's pretty insane <laughs> It's, it's a pretty, pretty magical. It's pretty magical. Yeah, but but um, do you, but it, do you but yeah. do you agree? I don't mean to cut you off, but the whole yeah. Sundance mythology and yeah. every filmmaker in the world wants to go to Sundance and be in Sundance and everybody wants to God forbid win Sundance or win an Crazy. award at Sundance would be yeah. insane. But do you feel that there is this lottery ticket mentality when it comes to filmmakers where they just like they put all their eggs in the Sundance basket or oh, they're hell. like this is the this is the only way this is going to happen and i always say i i've 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 uh, donated to robert redford's retirement fund quite often oh my god and it's a donation it's a donation it's a sundance yeah. donation <laughs> I, I i do it every time i have a project <laughs> It's Absolutely. a sun. It's a Sunday <laughs> donation because you're, it's it's, it's a lottery. T- it's a lottery <clears throat> ticket, isn't it? Yeah. What is it now? It's like the submissions are up like above ten thousand or it's, something. Um, it's last, in 2018, it was eighteen thousand two hundred. Wow. And hundred and eighteen films, including shorts, were accepted. Yeah. It's it's a <laughs> well. This is I I I. Yeah. It's it's sort of this weird thing. I I look at it now, and it just has to do with the. You know, I say to my, I say to, I say this to people like we're in a content flood. You know, it, oh. it has to do with, has to do with our iPhones. And I'm picking up my iPhone here. It's like um, it's a great time to be a filmmaker, but it's also a very challenging time to because there's just so much content out there. And so even this movie that I I'm releasing in Halloween, which is called uh, Space Time, Manifest Destiny on Space Time. This is a little scrappy movie that um, is really meant for streaming. I mean, it is a virally you know, kind of, we just, I just wrote it to, to try to, you know, for these stars, these up and coming kids. To and get what's the movie some, about? What's the movie about break. real quick? So that's, tell oh, everybody oh, what the, the movie's about. Sure, sure, sure. The movie's about these two uh, co-eds, uh, a physics nerd and a uh, uh, hot sorority girl who wake up after Halloween, um, uh, this blackout party night, and they realize that they've missed the evacuation of Earth and they have to figure out what happened. And, uh, you know, chaos ensues, <clears throat> and it's um, it's a stoner comedy. It's really silly, and it's it's uh, it's just all sorts of quantum mechanics fun, and it spoofs all sorts of bullshit. It's it spoofs The Matrix and Back to the Future, and uh, it's got every single scene is like a little nugget for cinephiles like you and I. So, you know, nobody can take this movie seriously. That's not the goal. You know, it's really just uh, have a couple drinks or a smoke and and let it ride on a Halloween you know, night party or something like that. And it, uh, you know, my, my sales agent, when we first started to, to show it, he goes, Oh, you got a cult classic on your hands. This will be mm-hmm. fine. I'm like, okay. You know, it's, it's really just really, uh, just all sorts of fun. Um, but, um, I wrote it with this viral mentality in mind to just try to, you know, it's just look at it's like, you can give me a little bit of money. Okay, fine. This is what we're going to do. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, we, we work in a world where, you know, there's no middle ground anymore. You either have stars and you can do what, what we like did on the banker where we just like, listen, without Samuel L. Jackson, this movie does not work. Right. You know, it's like the only way this works is if we have that guy. And it was a, a casting strategy to do that. But with, but with that but, said, with the cast, yeah. I just want to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to touch on the yeah. casting. You yeah. know, Sam Jackson is obviously one of the biggest stars in the world, and he's very, very yeah. recognizable. And he yeah. he does do the two hundred, three hundred, four hundred million dollar movies, and yeah. he'll also do 
a lower budget independent film. He's he just he, wants to work, and it's the kind of actor he is. But yep. the days of a movie star opening a movie oh, are yeah. are gone. But they yet are gone. Yeah. They, they are gone. So. Um, yep. You know, Sam Jackson's not going to open a movie by himself at $200 million. In, in The Avengers, he will. But at a certain budget right. range, it makes perfect sense. And that's more for international right. than it is for domestic. Or how does that right. work in your, in your eyes? With, yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, when I started at the studio, we were at a 60-40 uh, split. So the, I worked in the domestic uh, marketing environment. And so we had, we, we had sort of the green light uh, final say. Uh, in a lot of the movies because we were the majority of the market. Now, with it being more like 60-40, it's, it's much more of an international green light, and, and therein lies the migration into where we stand today. Then you, then you add in the, 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 the fact that DVDs have disappeared and oh, that streaming is not, uh, not making up nearly the difference. And um, so we have this really interesting you know, kind of uh, transition period that we're in. And uh, somebody like Sam, uh, he he performs across the board, so it's mm -hmm. a it's a carte blanche. You're getting your movie finance kind of thing. Um, other people don't necessarily have that punch, you know. Um, and so it's a it's a case by case experiment mm -hmm. to kind of see where the the equilibrium is. With 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 the movie The Banker, we're good. Like Apple picked it up, they're releasing it in um, December. They're putting it in a, a small theatrical. Like we're we're in good that's shape awesome. with that one. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's actually great, and and it's a very very cool story. And Sam did it because of you know the story. It's uh, it's about um, it's written and directed by a friend um, George Nolfi, who you might remember from like Ocean series and Adjustment Bureau. It's a true story about the the first African American bankers who had to. Uh, pose as uh, a chauffeur and uh, uh, um, a cleaning guy to, to kind of help uh, a white front man that they had figured out uh, to buy the banks. And so they would, they'd buy these banks and they'd kind of, um, that's awesome. It was, it's a crazy caper -ish story and it, uh, it just goes all the way to Congress and it's an amazing, an amazing film that so, came out really well. So, so with a movie like the banker where you've got Sam Jackson, which basically is the driving force behind it meaning uh, audience wise the audience that you're going to find for that i mean obviously the niche audience is not going to be people interested in banking you know Correct. heist films it's about Which people was, who are right it's people right. who are interested yeah. in sam jackson at this point you better believe it yeah exactly so and, and getting that script getting that script finance was more of like uh, there were so many so many different people who said but it's a movie about banking i said it's a very smart script and george is an incredible writer and it is a movie about banking, so the marketability is tough. So we, we had to kind of get over that and make it for this, make it for a smart number, and and get real cast, you know, to make it happen. So then, um, then your other movie that you just direct, the Manifest Destiny, Down Space Time, that the opposite, yeah, it's the complete yeah. opposite where you exactly. you're you've actually developed the product, which is much more niche, which is a stoner Correct. comedy, Correct. and yeah. that is the that is the selling point of that film. Correct. You know, because there is no cast of of Correct. any marketable cast that Correct. matters. Correct. Do you Correct. think? And and this is something I've been you know preaching from the top of the mountains for all filmmakers, <clears throat> especially independent filmmakers. But this obviously can work with within a higher budget range as well. Is that the future? There is such a dilution of content. There's just an, yeah. an insane. I mean, the TV alone. Yeah. I'm still catching up on HBO shows from like the early 2000s. I yeah. just finished yeah. The Wire. For the, I mean, literally, uh, I mean, it was such yeah. a great show. So it, there's yeah. so much great content. Um, yeah. The only way that a film, any film even, without major marketing muscle or major yep. star power yep. is going to be niche. So yep. the more niche you get, that's what's going to cut through all the noise. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly the uh, – that was my approach <laughs> to uh, Space Time. Um, it was to try – and, and I think your your group your your um, <clears throat> your universe will really, I think, get this. Which was, you know, I had some talented clients of mine that were just, you know, I'm, I'm an artistic coach, and I tried to develop develop talent. And then I had a financer come in and said, I have this much money. Can you make a movie? I said, Okay, cool. I'm going to back into this. Um, this is how much you've given me. No problem. 
I have these two people that, that are kind of oil and water to begin with, which is comedy gold to me. And uh, let's figure out a subject that kind of feels current. And then let's throw in as many crazy zinger one-liners that feel viral and let's make a movie. And that was it. And it, it's really designed to be laugh out loud funny, which I think for, for people who have seen it, they, they do think it's really funny. Um, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's not intended to make sense. In fact, it's making fun at the, the current science, which makes no logical sense. So that's that. <laughs> Sorry, you know, yeah. it's also existential. So for people who don't really understand existential comedy, like Waiting for Godot, it's frustrating. Is you know, like they're like, mm-hmm. it is a road trip movie that goes nowhere. It's, and it's a stoner road trip movie that goes nowhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, you're frustrated. That's the point. Our existence on on planet Earth with Trump, it is frustrating. <laughs> so that but, that's kind of the joke. But let me ask you this though. So. And yeah. this is where I find the smart producers and the and the artists they sometimes don't meet. This yeah. movie obviously sounds more experimental. It totally. obviously yeah. it, it's yeah. obviously a little it's bit absurd. more experimental. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah. It's really yeah. <clears throat> you're really swinging for the fences on this, uh, yeah. meaning that you're like we think we have an audience for it. We don't totally. know. We but, have no idea. Right. But right. the budget, I'm assuming is at a much smarter point than you the banker. It. You got it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a fraction, a fraction. It's craft yeah. services. It's craft services, basically. Exactly. The budget for craft it's, services on the banker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. It's, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. I mean, this is a kind of – you know exactly what you're saying. It is – it's that scrappy. That's all it is. It's, yeah, but, but a lot of filmmakers will try to make Manifest Destiny down space-time on yeah. a and they're going to go out for 6 years trying to raise 20 million dollars right. because that's their vision. And right. that's where we all and then some and sometimes every once in a while someone gives up the money. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's then, true. Right? We that's all true. see those yeah, movies yeah, like yeah. how did this get financed? How, exactly. exactly. What is this? Exactly. Who's, who gave it? Why didn't they exactly. call me? Why didn't they give yeah. me the money? <laughs> I would have done something with that. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting thing to try to find the I, – I say the word balance or equilibrium a lot because it is that. It's mm-hmm. just sort of like, well, what are you going to do? I said – and I, I put my artistic hat on, and I said, okay, I like, to, I like creative challenges. I like to kind of make the most of the situation, and I do have, a, I do have something I'd like to say, and I can do it with this money. I can do it with this. To me, in this movie um, – Manifest Destiny Now in Space Time, it was really, really fun. That, mm-hmm. This movie was really fun to, to do because it was about quantum mechanics. And I, I didn't know anything about quantum mechanics oh, until doing this movie. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> and that was so exciting. I am so grateful to have had an opportunity to make this movie because I learned so much. So, and, and to that extent, like the movie's really just to be, it, it's supposed to be a physics for dummies. It's supposed to be for people like me who grew up and missed physics class. And it's, it's supposed to be like, hey, did you know there's something called entanglement? Like, what are you talking about? It's not just a, a love position. It's like, no, no, no. Particles entangle. It, it's kind of an awesome thing, you know? So it's, it's, it's making fun of myself, frankly. That's <laughs> awesome. Know, that, that, that's the idea. Yeah, but that's a great thing to be as an artist where you can go out and do that and create and, and, and be oh, the, so, uh, do it. Yeah. But you have to do it because it's such an expensive art form. You have to do it yeah. for a budget. You have to do it for yeah. like, I, like you say, a smart number, which I'm going to steal yeah. now. This, I'm going to use that all the time now. You have to do yeah, it for a yeah. smart number because it's, yeah. it's, you know, like I did my movie. I, I went to Sundance and I shot a, a narrative, uh, you know, waiting for Guffman meets uh, awesome. Best of Show about filmmakers at Sundance, completely guerrilla, and we did it for three grand. Awesome. And and I did I shot the whole movie. Awesome. It's a narrative and but I can't do that for twenty million. I can't exactly. do that for a million. I can't exactly. I can't I can't take those kind of risks. Exactly. You know? Exactly. But, and, but it was good. Okay. Yeah, risk. This is a good that it, the risk is the big big word. I feel you. Yep. Yeah, I mean I, like if someone would have given me fifty grand, eighty grand yeah. to do this, I'd be like I don't know yeah. if this is that project. I mean, it's a. Yeah. This is perfectly designed for my audience. It's a perfect. Yeah. It's, a, it's who's my audience for that? People who are interested in Sundance, pe- exactly. filmmakers, 
my yeah. audience who know who I am and what you know what I do, and yeah. and, and that's and then maybe some people interested in the filmmaking process. That that's yes. It's not a really lucrative monster, you know. It's not like a stoner comedy. There's a lot of people totally. who want stoner comedies, but not a lot of people who want to watch this movie. But at a three thousand dollar budget, right? I'll make twenty of those. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You no, know, you're you're absolutely right. And I think there's this, um, you know, in in terms of at least with you know something with with my my stoner movie, there was something about it that was such a particular balance of. I'm trying to get a get sort of a a tone out, and at the same time, you are you are operating in this like little tiny economic wiggle room um, where the concept was born out of the money, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. It was that's born a, a, out of that's a should in the in the independent world. Yeah, yeah, and and that <clears throat> that was just fin- that was a fantastic challenge. Um, it was just, it was crazy. You know, and, and the funny thing is that you have the experience of working with bigger budgets. You have the experience of working within the studio system. So you I call know it the luxury. The, the, yes, the luxury. Yes. yes, yes. They're sushi. You know I mean? They're sushi for lunch and, and lobster tail. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've been on those sets. They're fantastic. Um, They're amazing. Yeah. But right. but I, but I've also been a, like, let's just grab the, that slice of pizza over there, um, <laughs> right. and that's, that's dinner right. for everybody. Uh, so that's I've, right. That's I, right. I, but it is. It, I find it, at least as, a, as an artist, much more interesting to do a movie at such a ridiculously low budget because yep. I'm free to do yeah. whatever I want. And you're out yeah. there kind of on a tightrope without a net. And yeah. I, I, as an artist, I love doing that, but I have to be responsible when you do that. Again, 80 grand, not so much. Three grand, totally. absolutely, go take your risk. Yeah, totally. This this was also an opportunity for me to return to performing because I play the agent in it. So I was going around um, the lens, and for that reason alone, like I sure. put my own money in it. You know, it's like it's ever, it's like it's a, it's a, it's all in. You know, yeah. it's like this is what you do. Like this is how we do this, and like it's about the risk. And and there's just it's experimental and it's fun. Um, I'm not I'm not gonna you know jump out of the the office of when I was at Sony and, and jump into Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, which was shooting at the stu- you know the stage across the street. Like that's just not where I'm at in my career, and I'm cool with that, you know. But but it's pretty awesome to be able to walk around and see the scale. You know, to me that's yeah. that's kind of the most most fun about it. You know, it's just that that sense of the different resources that people people operate with. Yeah, and that's it, okay. Yeah, you know, it's like. I, I was talking to uh, there was an, uh, a director friend of mine who was talking to uh, was happened to be on set shadowing James Cameron, and wow. on on the on the Avatar set when the Avatar was wow. going on, and he awesome. was there sitting there and he's just talking to him and then he started asking him like indie questions, like yeah. questions like like perspectives from an independent filmmaker, sure. And James Cameron had no idea. What he he just he couldn't grasp because yeah. he lives in his world. He lives in James Cameron's world, which is fine. Yeah. Yeah. We need we need a James Cameron out there. We need totally. a Spielberg. We need a Nolan. These guys who have these massive paintbrushes and massive canvases because that's what we go paintbrush. to the movies for. I say the same thing. It's exactly right. Yeah. These are massive paintbrushes and massive right. canvases, that's right. and we that's, wa- right. that's why we go to cinema. You want totally. that? That's kept. Scale. But it was yeah. fascinating to you, like. If I t- like when I, I was on the streets of Sundance and I was meeting producers and buzzy buddies of mine um, on su- while I was shooting the movie in the middle of the craziness of Sundance and they're like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm shooting a movie. And you could see their face just yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, uh, you're doing you're, I'm like, what? like, yeah, we're shooting right now. The, the confusion is so <laughs> wonderful to see yeah, in their yeah. faces. <laughs> That's um, great. It's so fa- That's but great. It's fa- but it's fascinating um, perspectives. <clears throat> I mean, like Peter Jackson on, Absolutely. on the Lord of the Rings. Oh man! Can you? I mean, the, the, the no. scope of these these guys Dude, is it's a, it's an army. It's, it's an army. And also, and yeah. a lot of people don't yeah. understand the pressure. That oh. is on the shoulders of these these guys. That yeah, yeah. You get two hundred million dollars on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be a. That's a, a special kind of. You know, you don't have to just be an artist. I talk. I talked to my 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 business partner Namdi about this <clears throat> yesterday because we were talking about he's he's an NFL star, and um, 
he's he's moving over to uh, acting, and he was he uh, he was one of the stars of Crown Heights, and we were producers on that film together, and then um, we've been producing content, um, and then we'll we'll pick a cu- we'll pick a movie um, that he's going to star in very carefully, and we picked this next movie, Sylvie, the one with Tessa Thompson. I said this is the perfect movie for him to to star in because I I like to you know when it comes to building star talent, you have to do it very particularly because people don't really understand the pressure that's on the star. They don't mm-hmm. really understand what it's like for that person's face to be plastered across the entire globe and the level of, of art, artistic integrity that it takes to build you know, a, a star that can really open a movie or just that level of success where the audience responds to the fact that they... They go to the movies because they know that person makes good content. They they go they're 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 loyal to that star, like Sandra Bullock. I worked on Premonition, and she's called she's Evergreen. We call her Evergreen. She'll she'll open a movie, and the box office will sustain way beyond the norm because Sandra Bullock just has this sense, of, you know, this loyal following. You know, to create that level of value in the consumer's mind, to be of that much service to them. Mm-hmm. To be of service to the to the to the audience that you work for them, uh, and, and, and to allow that to really be developed in a in a in a in a way, it comes up for my partner and I because he has such specific, classy taste. And this next movie is is really quite classy. And then the next movie that we are planning to produce after that is is very special and, and will be more risky for him in terms of what he can do with the, his acting chops. Mm-hmm. But that sense of being able to just take baby steps and just grow organically the, the next from this, you know, this rung to the ladder to that rung, not that rung. Mm-hmm. Don't go up there. You know, just just very, very mindful of the learning curve and just the level of responsibility that you're taking on both economically, artistically, those things are really interesting to me, you know, especially at my age. I just find it to be fascinating. I, so. I, 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 I've, I've always found it very interesting to study uh, Tom Cruise's career because he oh, is man. just – he is one of those actors who exactly what you said, to be of service to the audience. He, he does yeah. his own stunts. He does what I he does. I respect him. He, I mean, regardless if you like him, don't like him with all the stuff that he sure. goes through. Of course. As an artist, as an actor, as yeah. a businessman within the yeah. film industry – Man, he delivers, man. Those Mission Impossible movies, like he's literally yeah. hanging yeah. from that oh, airplane. Like, and I just watched, <laughs> I know, I missed the last one and I just watched it two weekends ago and I was just like, this guy just, is unbelievable. Just, I was just, just like, I oh, forget. It's just, like, it's just yeah. I, can't, I can't. I can't. I can't even. I just can't yeah. even. And the guy's, what, yeah. 105 now? How old is he? <laughs> I, mean, I know. I know. I know. He looks he might, like he's been drinking formaldehyde for years. You know. No, he bathes in in, in baby's yeah. blood. That's that's basically that's right. what I heard. I've heard that through the grapevine. That's how he stays so youthful. <laughs> Him and J Lo, uh, yeah. they have the same uh, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something going on there. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's uh, true, man. So I want to ask you. Um, a f- I'm going to ask you a yep. few questions uh, that I ask all of my my guests. But one oh, okay. last question I want to ask you <clears throat> before we get to the final questions is. Yeah. Do you think that filmmakers moving forward, especially independent filmmakers, but even at filmmakers who aren't as independent, I mean, you do independent films like like Space Time, but you also do larger budget projects with larger stars as well. Right. Do you believe that filmmakers really need to start treating or start uh, approaching filmmaking in an entrepreneurial spirit, in more oh. of like a like a I I coin the term film entrepreneur. So it's kind That's of good. like, yeah. which is like looking at it like how how can I how can we recoup our money, how can we maybe generate other revenue streams from these films, how can we build right. out businesses, how build our portfolios, all that kind of stuff. Even on a fi- even at the five thousand dollar movie level, dude. If I you totally do twi- get it. if you do twenty movies at five thousand dollars a piece and each of those make twenty thousand dollars, that's a business. And if it absolutely. keeps absolutely right. So what's what's your point? What's what do you think? I, 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 we live in a world where that's, that's, that is front and center now. I mean, with the YouTube generation, the influencers, the content creators, uh, people like Gary Vee. I mean, these people are extraordinary. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very intrigued and, and, and fascinated by, by 
by that. Um, manifest testing down space time isn't going to ever make its money back in terms of what, what it's getting streaming. But I've got these crazy, you know, T-shirts and cups where if people actually like it, they just go to the mall and they can buy a, a T-shirt that says, I'm not having sex with you again, fucker. You know, it's like, that's just funny, like, sticky stuff. So there is this... Um, there is this full service mentality that I think as filmmakers we have to have today. And it's just part of the way. Um, and, and interestingly enough, historically, film is an entrepreneurial business. It always was. It's called um, Disney. It's it, called Disney. I mean, seriously. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, it's hist historically, it, it's a group of entrepreneurs that, that left New York to, to, to form Hollywood. Right. And ever, you know, it, it wasn't until vertical integration in the 60s that public money came in and, and everything kind of like got kind of wacky do. Mm -hmm. um, but look where we are now. I think fundamentally, it's still a great, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be a filmmaker. We have to continue to be entrepreneurial. You know, you brought up Sex Lies and Videotapes. These are extraordinarily smart movies that are very, very creative and, and, you know, mixing media like that one did and finding just new ways to create really interesting stories. And I think it continues to go back to this. A lot of people say, like, well, it's so competitive. It's, like, it's competitive because we still have to sharpen our pencils. Like, we need to be good storytellers. Mm -hmm. that's, what we're, that's what people are just looking for, good stories. They're looking for good stories that are $300 million, right? And they're looking for good stories that are like eight thousand dollars. Like it's storytelling. Yeah. And I was I, I talked to a friend of mine at uh, he works at Disney Animation, and he was telling me, I'm like, how how much how, how much did they make? He almost like he was telling me how much the 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 the, the, the animated movies were making, the, how they broke it oh, down, yeah. like they did the whole. How, we made this much from this this like from merchandising from this and that. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. when it came to Frozen. <laughs> oh man, get get out of here. Frozen made a billion. In in box office, yeah. But that how was much not... how much do you think they made on the dresses? That's it. Just the little dresses that my daughters bought and oh, every other oh, little yeah. girl bought. How much do you think they made off of just the dresses? Oh, it has to be a lot. I'm sure a billion it's... dollars on the yeah, dresses. Yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say because <laughs> Disney I, Disney makes twenty billion a year at least, and doesn't it? It's like the ratio is amazing. It's a toy company. You know. Oh no, their merchant. I mean, I mean, the merch I mean, is crazy. It's like George Lucas says, the money's in the lunchbox, guys. Absolutely. I mean, it's, but they're entrepreneurs. Disney's an entrepreneurial. Absolutely. I mean, they they're not about just making a movie, and then just selling that movie as the product. It's about yeah. thousands well, of other ancillary. But that's that's why they're winning. Yeah. And boy, are they! Whether you like it or yeah. not, they're definitely winning. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and by, real quick, you made a movie for Netflix as well, right? But with uh, Brie Larson. Oh um, well, the Brie Larson movie was uh, Basmati Blues. That's 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 probably on its way into that that distribution model now. It's um it's a musical um, mm -hmm. with uh, Donald Sutherland and Tyne Daly, and mm -hmm. shot that in Mumbai. That was quite quite a quite an amazing adventure. And you shot um, and you and you produced that one as well. I co-produced that. Yeah. Okay. And what yeah. was it like yeah. working with Netflix? I've always, I just love asking producers who work with Netflix. I hear wonderful stories. Well, I have that. That movie was made independently, and then oh. it went into distribution through Shout Factory, and and has been, you know, handed over into the Got sort of it. you know the streaming environment. I haven't personally worked directly with Netflix, although I have some friends, some dear friends, who are working at Netflix now, and I'm you know, you know, it's just it's an amazing. I mean, the the the, the evolution of that com company is is unbelievable. They changed so. the game. They changed the entire industry. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's, you like it or not, they changed the entire. Yeah, this is this is where it's like, yeah, whether you like it or not, like this is what's happening. We have to figure out how, what it means for everybody else. You know, where do you think where do you think this is all going to go? I mean, I mean, because I feel that what we're going through now with the industry, the film industry, is what the music business went through five, I, eight, I was, eight years ago. Yeah, that's exactly where my mind went too, and I've been thinking about that even coming up. You know, for manifest destinies on space time. Um, that was written at a time when Trump was not president, mm -hmm. and that's the joke. It's actually it's sort of like a doomsday scenario about Trump. If if Trump had won, this is what was going to happen. Sure, sure. And and even just in the last five years, um, looking at sort of how that process has evolved to today, it's it is this um, you know dilution. Uh, of of the the flood itself, the value itself, and and how we monetize things, 
it's changed uh, drastically. So I, d I don't know in terms of uh, the, what, what we might say is the correction in the marketplace. I, I think that it, it puts a lot of pressure on us storytellers to be even better at what we're, what we're doing. It, it puts a lot of pressure on us to be uh, to find a certain uh, unique voice and and try to you know cultivate our own sort of um, our own fan base and, and develop ourselves in sort of our own way and um, you know there's this uh, amazing expanding um, uh, global uh, universe and I think that's what gives me hope. A lot of people get very doomsday about movie making and I said why. Said the, the the expansion of the internet. We're only at 30 30 percent penetration to the seven billion people out there. You know this is a this isn't an upward economic picture. It really just depends on you know where you're focusing your own integrity and where you're focusing your own skills, and uh, and not limiting yourself. I think um, more importantly than anything. So, you know, like for me, I've got projects that you know I'm working on with clients or collaborators that are really really inexpensive things because. Who's to judge? It's not about the budget, you know, to me, you know, it's sort of like there was, there used to be the sort of like, well, you know, you're working on Spider-Man. I was like, so you're working on Spider-Man. I know what that's like. You know, that's, that's 5,000 people all running around and who's really in charge? You know, it's not, that's not this. So it's, it's sort of where, where you can find your own sort of peace of mind inside um, the, the, the opportunities is more important than ever. Very and and like in the film and like in the music industry, you know, artists now the money is not in publishing, it's not in radio it, plays, right. it's in concerts, per touring, performance, t shirts, right. and then now they're right. even doing like autograph and photo ops, they're selling right. for, for VIP tickets, and they're just right. It's the Merch. it's the new world, it's the new world right. that we live in, and I think filmmakers need to think that way moving forward. Yeah, it's it's a very, very complete entrepreneurial. Um, you know, spirit. I think Without that's really question. what it is. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. Ask you, I'll ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. What advice, sure. would, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Uh, a, a, a filmmaker, I would say focus on your, your writing skills. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's interesting to me um, how important that skill is and continues to be, and it's one of the fundamentals. Um, and I often meet meet filmmakers and and various type of of you know crew and all that kind of stuff who who want to be writer directors or want to want to want to direct something, and I often just say, well, directors usually come in in a lot of different directions, but 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 usually there's like this writer director that becomes um, mm -hmm. the the real kind of voice that we're like, wow, how they get there? They wrote they wrote they wrote that script. You know, there's something about that that. I don't think that's going to change. So focus on writing skills. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Um, the lesson, I'm learning lessons every day. We all <laughs> I are. just went through this morning. Yeah. Um, I, I think the lesson, um, for me, it has to do with just, usually with money, um, how to how to work with the amount of money that you have to, to do what it is that you're ultimately trying to do. And that comes down to being okay working in baby steps. Um, it's, it's so often that people are like, well, I want to do that. I said, good, that's a big dream. How does that, how does that start? Right. It starts with you putting one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. and discipline. Um, I come from a military family background and I think discipline is one of the more fundamental things because it's in your control to have. Everybody can have discipline. You can have discipline right now. It's really just letting yourself kind of get into a mechanism and taking one step in, in, in front of the other. Like, like the banker, uh, Joel Vertel, who's the lead producer, he's been developing and working on that film, I think it's for 20 years. That project has been in development since he was at Paramount. And that was for both of us 15, 20 years ago. He picked that thing up. So these are these stories. These stories take a long time, you know, to to come to life, and that's good. That's mm -hmm. okay. You know, just take your time. Be patient. And for me, I think that's been one of the harder ones to really come to peace with. You know, patience.
What is the biggest fear you had to overcome when making your first, uh, your first film as a director? Yeah, that's judgment. You know, <laughs> that, that sense of people are going to not, they're not going to like this. Uh, for me, when I, when, I, I, when I started directing because I'm such a musical theater nerd, like musical theater people get my sense of humor. Mel Brooks people do. Like, I'm a weird, weird director. No question. Um, getting a sense of just that, that zany, like, you know, tone, that, that is a, a place where you're just, I go in knowing that a vast majority of the market is not going to like me. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's just that. Like, but those people who get it laugh and, and, and we share a smile, we share a wink, you know, so I'm pretty cool. I feel better about that now. Um, and certainly with Manifest Destiny Down Space Time, that's a departure into absurdist theater. It's absurd. <laughs> Obviously. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. And so people who are like serious, I'm like, no, no, <laughs> go see Waiting for Godot and then, then call me. Like, this is frustrating. This is, this is like, a, you know, it's supposed to be challenging. And that's, that's okay. You know, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, now, what are the th- what are your f- three favorite fears? Um, excuse me, three favorite fears. Three favorite films of all time. The producers. Um, oh, great movie. Doctor Strangelove, and I would say, you know, I had to say about the original Star Wars. Like, of course, it's something. It, it, some something. I mean, I just I'm such a, a a John Williams fan. I miss I miss melodic musical themes in cinema today like mm-hmm. if you're a composer out there melody melody give me something uh, give me something to like bring my spirits to life so yeah that's those are those are those now where can people uh find more more about what work you're doing and uh, your films yeah okay so um you are more than welcome to check out what i'm up to uh, jbprodinc.com or um, Instagram, JB Studio LA is where I do a lot of my like coaching and that kind of thing. And then for Manifest Destiny Down Space Time, you can find me on social media. Uh, Space Time uh, is really the one to kind of search for, but Manifest Destiny Down is uh, manifestdestinydown.com is the website, and you can you can IMDb me whatever you want. Very cool. And you are Jonathan number f- Jonathan Baker number five. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of Jonathan Bakers out there, and I'm the, I'm number five. So okay. you know, everybody's. I gotta meet them all. I, I kind of want to have like a John Baker club and be like, hey, let's all get together. Like, let's all hang out. I th- I think some of us actually look alike too. So it's just like. <laughs> scary pretty it's, awesome it's it's quite scary sir uh jonathan so. it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show thank you so much for thanks. coming on man thanks so. 